Thank you very much, Sheila, for your, I would like to say, intriguing and challenging <laughs> talk. Uh, so we have, we have uh, time for collecting questions, and there is already one over there. Yes, thank you very much for your really fascinating talk. And uh, I fully agree uh, with you about the fact that uh, in STS we need to uh, investigate more about the power relationships and inequalities. And on this, on this fact, uh, I would like to make uh, a theoretical point. The fact that um, Latour and uh, Lowe uh, borrowed the, the concept of actant from uh, Gramassian semiotics, by, but they did not clarify that in uh, semiotics, uh, actants are always asymmetrical. So uh, in semiotics, actants, uh, there are hierarchies, there are power relationships. Uh, um, according to a, a typology of roles in which we have, uh, uh, for example, actants who manipulate, actants who express judgment, who are located on an upper level with respect to other roles. So uh, maybe we, we need to refine also the analytical models. Just a, a brief comment. Thank you. Yeah, so th thank you for that intervention. And, um, but one of the things I would say is that uh, one of the problems I have with economists as a class of um, very intelligent uh, disciplinary professionals is that they think that everything needs to be rediscovered through uh, the basic presumption of their field about how individual preference is the thing that organizes the world. And I sometimes feel that way about actants. And I was, um, l last year I was at a meeting where the punchline that somebody came up with was actors are actants too. And that seemed to capture to me the, the absurdity of the full circle. I mean, I think you're right that when we think about objects in the world, which we should think about, that what exactly has been, what discretion, what judgmental, judgmental capability has been committed to them is something that we need to talk about. But should we lose sight of the fact that to some degree those are themselves products of design and that the responsibility for what we have encoded into particular things still rests on um, pieces of the imagination that were in people to start with. Um, so it's not, I mean, this is a long-going theoretical conversation that should be had. So in that sense, I agree with you. Who is the next? The microphone is coming. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. I have two short comments. Um, so f uh, first is um, I know open interrogation because so um, about uh, if you will the, the, the impasses and the deadlocks of the ANT uh, approach because <clears throat> to some extent um, also going back to it you also need to replace it within you know its post structuralist uh, foundations and you know as a continuation of the, the the Foucault endeavor to to finish with this world to knowledge um, and and um, so I was just thinking that, you know, in these early ANT works, um, you know, maybe what they were doing is what more experi experimenting a method, you know, of being able to say things in media res, so you know, you know, within uh, things, and maybe um, one of the deadlocks and, and and that that have happened is that STS scholars have just um, been locked within the method. Um, and they have not been able to use it uh, within other ways that can uh, purport more normative claims. And uh, maybe a short also, a second point is also about um, STS as a field, because, um, well, STS encompasses a lot of different disciplines. I myself, uh, I'm trained as a jurist, not as a social scientist. 
And so we have people with different methodologies, different backgrounds, and also maybe this explains because uh, you know the, the lack of commitment with values and with norms because I'm not sure um, you know you can say the same things and make the same claims coming from different backgrounds, although we now have some common uh, tools and methodologies. So thank you. Well, um, so uh, as far as your first point is concerned, um, yes, disciplines and methods evolve, but one way in which something spreads is by methodology becoming uh, more stabilized so people know what they're doing. Uh, and so the uh, rigidification that you're talking about, that people now use the method in a more uh, wooden way than perhaps uh, an inspired person would use it. I mean, that's true of method in, in any field. But it remains the case that, uh, you know, the STS scholar is not likely to take a phenomenon of the world and see what role science and technology plays in it. They're much more likely to take a phenomenon of science and technology and to say what role that plays in the world. I mean, this is just a sort of mapping of territory. You could take the papers at this conference and just ask, what is the starting point of inquiry for each paper and see you know, how many of them come out on what, I mean, you know, you do a little statistical exercise. Um, so, when I somewhat ironically put up my rules of method, uh, I think that they are actually uh, not the conventional rules of method in our field. And I say that as a person who is widely recognized as uh, somehow being of STS but not in STS. I mean, that is, you know, even within my own field, if people want to say, you know, name some STS scholars, this is not the direction that, that is the majority direction. I think that the historical basis for this, to some extent, lies on the two sides of the Atlantic. I mean, that is the preoccupation with semiotics, et cetera, is not so, so much what the American STS started with. American STS started as science, technology, and society. It was not theoretically very sophisticated, but the and society was important. And you know, many of us, I mean, I after all headed a department where there was a politics of name changing from science, technology, and society to science and technology studies. And now at Harvard, where I have a very different uh, set of institutional constraints, I purposely named my program Science, Technology, and Society. And you can ask you know, why I did so, but the point is that it does have to do with these rules of method, and it relates to your second question as well, that there are indeed different theoretical, I mean, different disciplinary things that come into STS, but increasingly I hear in younger STS people saying that they're being trained in STS, and on this side of the Atlantic, when they say they're being trained in STS, almost inevitably it means AMT. So, you know, I'm glad you're a jurist. Uh, I am a lawyer by training, I say. Uh, so, uh, you know, we have that in common. But uh, the number of people with legal training in STS, you can count on the fingers of one hand on my side of the Atlantic. Uh, thank you for your uh, very interesting speech. Uh, I just was I was just wondering two things. Um, while you were uh, at the very end of, of your speech, uh, at a certain point, uh, if I didn't misunderstood, you said something like a sociological turn in STS. Um, if I misunderstood, please forgive me. <laughs> if not, if, <laughs> I, I would have asked you if you could uh, add something about uh, the idea of a sociological turn in STS. And the other thing so was... Could you just repeat this? Sociological, what did I say? Turn. If I, oh, sociological If I turn. got it right, yeah. you said something like uh, a sociological turn in STS at, at a certain point of, at, okay. at, the, mm. at the end of the speech. So I wanted to ask you if you could please add something more, but maybe I misunderstood what, what you said. And uh, the other point was about the ontological politics you were uh, mentioning at the end. Uh, in fact, from your speech, I was expecting something about a kind of performative politics. So I, I would also ask you if you could comment on this some, some more. Thanks. 
Yeah, thanks. So, well, uh, by the sociological turn, all I meant was that history and philosophy of science have both been around as of science and technology fields for a long time, and sociology is a relatively late comer. And all I meant by that was that at some point, people started saying, let's not just look at the historical evolution of scientific concepts, history of science, uh, let's not just look at what philosophers say truth is, but let's treat it as a human and social activity, and therefore let's turn it into sociology. Um, but what I was contrasting that with is what about a political turn? I mean, you know, so how, what would that look like? Um, sorry, what was your second point? Oh, about performative politics. Yeah, well, I could say read the book. I mean, <laughs> you know, the new book that's coming out talks about performativity in the introduction a lot. Um, I think that it's something that I would put side by side with practices which uh, get a lot of attention. Um, Elizabeth did a wonderful job yesterday of pointing to practice as a field of study. Uh, but in the same way that you might, and in fact she did talk about how it's not the hand alone but the hand with the hammer, uh, you might wonder about practices without performance. So for those of us in this audience who actually do have juridical backgrounds, practice and performance are very tied up in you know, the whole idea of a forum or a courtroom. You know, it's uh, sure there are many detailed practices the way the documents get produced, the way witnesses are questioned, the rules that go into what kind of evidence may be produced, the technicalities of how you move the blood spot from the scene of the crime into the DNA lab. I mean, there's STS work on all of that, but it is also a moment of persuasion and performance, and this is why um, in my own work, I say that the connecting thread has been public reason, that is not just the making of the argument or the making of the evidence, but also how that plays out in public space, in public arenas, with all the associated questions of what do we mean by public anyway and you know, boundary drawing. I mean, all of our methodological things would come into play. But the performativity to me is uh, definitely there as an analytic thing that one has to make sense of. I mean, we can say performance. Yesterday, there was a little bit of dis discussion about the word script and, you know, what that implies. For script Im implies performance to some extent as well. Um, and I think that we, once attuned to it, of course, we can find performativity in the micro and performativity in the macro, and how these things cross scales becomes interesting. Uh, someone like Pablo Bochkovsky, who was a colleague of mine at Cornell and now is at Northwestern, talks about the role of the media in producing public performances in some senses. You know, why is it that in my iPhone app, I can click on my BBC News, my Guardian, and my New York Times, and most of the time, the top story will be the same. I mean, that is, what is the kind of media performativity that's, that's happening in those kinds of contexts? So it's a very rich question, and there are many ways to approach it. Um, thank you for, and as always, a stimulating presentation. Um, I've been thinking over the past few year, days, as I imagine many of the participants in the conference have been, about this relationship between design and STS. And um, I'm hoping to, to um, get you to talk a little bit more to, to, to try and um, s separate or, or see how those things connect. And the particular thing I was thinking about is uh, that uh, there, uh, within the STS perspective, there's been a, a focus on this, uh, 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 the notion of there being a, a techno-scientific imaginary. In other words, that a kind of a classic division between science and technology uh, needed to be overcome uh, in, in terms of constructing a, a perspective, uh, an STS perspective. And it's, it's, it seems to me that, um, that in some ways that, uh, that conjoined perspective uh, creates a situation where we ultimately are thinking more, if you will, about science than about technology. And that um, by 
thinking about design as, in some ways, a, a point of mediation between those two things, um, and, uh, and, and trying to put those kinds of perspectives to the fore, you create space for the kind of politics that you're talking about, um, the, the forces of the world coming into existence, as opposed to the more rarefied, um, purely scientific imaginary. Um, I'm just wondering whether, whether there's, a, there's a space there for thinking about design in those terms. Um, yeah, definitely. I mean, I would say two things. One is that um, to some degree there already is a convergence between theorizing in the design field and in the STS field, and to some extent I think that those need to be brought together more. So uh, one of the things I'm particularly aware of being at Harvard is that critical theories of space are very important in STS where we've been talking about boundaries forever and also increasingly about spatiality itself as a, a piece of what needs to be analyzed, particularly for instance in connection with scales at which technologies apply and so on. And so I think that the, I mean, you know, if you're in STS, the first name you think of is Latour. If you're in uh, design or critical geography, you think of the fever. I mean, you know, the, the, there are different L words uh, that, that come to mind. So, you know, uh, what happens if the STS person chooses to think the other way and the design person the other way? I mean, you know, these are thought experiments that one can undertake. And, and I think in both of these fields, there's a newfound interest in temporality, which, uh, again, offers a sort of common space for thought, um, and possibly also in, um, uh, well, I mean, there are other coagulating ideas like sustainability. I mean, that is, uh, both of these fields are thinking about, about those concepts, but they're doing it in somewhat different ways. So I think it's a very fruitful conjunction, simply from the standpoint of different theoretical feeder uh, points of origin and, uh, um, the emphasis that those points of origin uh, produce in, in the work that people are thinking about. Um, on your second point, or the second part of your point about technoscience, um, the, I mean, if the point is that one way to read about technoscientific imaginaries and about technoscience in general is that pure ivory tower thought, the kind of thing where you had your envelope and your pencil and you were doing physics calculations on the back of it, that that is a thing of the past, that through our funding agencies, through practices, through the media, through our reward structures, the kind of science we're always rewarding more is the kind that actually has effects on the world. And yet when it comes to accountability discourse, we still talk about science, science's autonomy and self-regulation and so on and so forth, and therefore the sort of political follow through of techno science, namely that all the time there is a need for governance that is not coming from within, and then what should it be? I think that is one of the fundamental problems of what I would say is the political turn that, that we need to think about. Uh, I myself have used socio-technical imaginary because the anthropologists who write about the techno-scientific imaginary are usually talking about too internalist for my tastes about scientists and their ideas of what they're doing in the world. I think that that has to be looked at. But I think the socio-technical imaginary, a Lewis Strauss is not a scientist in the lab, a Vannevar Bush is not a technologist within MIT. These are people sitting in centers of power. Their imaginations, I think, need to be treated in a different way. Thank you very much for, for your talk. Uh, you, you talked about ontological politics and you talked uh, about um, power relations and, and the need to kind of attend to how these techno-scientific projects tell stories and make worlds and how that w we need to intervene in how these worlds are being made. Uh, and I agree very much with you and thank you for drawing our attention to, to these important questions. Uh, and, but at the same time I wonder uh, 
about, uh, it seems that what has recently been termed as feminist STS, I don't know if it is a, a, a term that uh, has been endorsed uh, more generally, it's, uh, they say it's exactly this sort of questions and this sort of politics that they are, have been, I'm talking about the work of Susan uh, Listar or of Haraway of, or of Satsman. There is this kind of tradition of 20, 30 years uh, of work that they are trying to bring uh, our attention into this, this sort of topics. And uh, I, I wonder whether, how they have become a kind of, they are present into their absence, that is somehow they kind of, this work does not appear in the disciplinary discourse, has, although it has been around for quite a long time, it doesn't seem to kind of, it's, it still seems to be absent as, as a kind mm. of a voice, and I would like your, your opinion well, about, is it something yeah. we dare not speak its name, kind of? Where, no, I mean, uh, it, look, uh, it's a very important uh, point, and again, one of the things I do in my introduction to this forthcoming book is set two passages of Latour and Haraway side by side to show how radically different the constructivist imaginations of those two people are. But um, a few things. I mean, first of all, feminist science studies and feminist technology studies is hardly a non-field. I mean, you know, there are plenty of people working in it, and I think particularly people who are working on biomedical topics and everything around reproductive technologies, but also gender and disease. I mean, you know, these, these are areas where I think feminist work is alive and well. Uh, a second point, though, is that um, the leading figures in feminist STS studies, I mean, just in the way that you named them, uh, it's tended to be American, and it's tended to be identified with American identity politics. Uh, so, for instance, you didn't say a name like Bina Agarwal. I don't know if you know who she is. So she is a heterodox economist, uh, but she's definitely a feminist, and she does feminist gender studies on uh, the economic implications of uh, development policies. Uh, but she would never be recognized within STS as a feminist technology studies scholar, even though if you started with some philosophical definition of the ontology of a feminist technology scholar, she would probably meet all the check boxes that you might check off. So I think that feminist STS, to some extent, you know, like it or not, in the works of Suchman and Starr and Haraway and Clark and Fujimura, to some extent, and you know, it's identified with more the identity side of things and less the structural side of things. And so, the, and you know, this has been true of a set of debates between, for instance, British feminism and American feminism. Now, now feminism, not just feminist STS. I mean, this has been uh, a thing that people have been talking about within feminism for a long time. Who is the real enemy? What is the outcome that we're really trying to to solve and so on and so forth. But I think I completely agree with you that a better, that first of all, feminist STS does have a sharp normative edge, you know, that is missing in some other dimensions of STS. It may be too uncritical as a normative edge in that it doesn't, uh, for my liking, take other inequalities on board in quite the same way. I think it may uh, also uh, be more attentive to microprocesses on the s and side and not as attentive to the microprocesses on the society side. But these are discussions, again, of exactly the sort that I think we ought to be having. Thank you very much. I'm Carol Temeno from Arizona State University. And, um, my question is more related to, well, in this wide angle vision of STS, if there is like a space for like, like self-reflection of the own discipline and the spaces where the knowledge is being created and power relations which within the STS theory and practice in terms of, um, well, more thinking in like if it falls as well into like uh, issues that it critiques in, you know, like relations between like 
global north, global south, and who gets to belong to the STS community, who gets not to, I mean, and there are like, for example, in Latin American, Latin, a lot of Latin American perspectives which are more familiar about, about dealing with issues that uh, you mentioned, but like from years ago that they don't get into the world of STS, but the, all the boxes are clearly checked and they're more like anti-imperialism yeah. visions and so on. So I don't know if you could comment a little bit about that. Well, again, a very important question. I mean, to some extent, of course, the 4S society is attempting to do that by moving its meetings around. Uh, I personally have somewhat mixed feelings about all of this. Um, so I think that the worry for me is about uh, whether we maintain a sense of what STS is in the process of moving it around in different ways. I mean, there is a risk if you look at the current complexion of 4S meetings that just about anything and everything counts. I mean, you know, that, that there's very low entry barriers and, you know, apart from money and apart from language, which are two extremely high entry barriers, um, as to who gets to count as an STS scholar and what work we recognize and reward as STS scholarship and so on and so forth. So I, you know, um, I've spent a good part of my last several years working on the disciplining side of the field. I mean, that is, I think, uh, on your first point, absolutely we need the critical self-reflection, but I think it needs to be grounded to some degree in history and in the plural, in histories, because I think SDS does have different genealogies. I mean, are we going to claim Marx as a technology and society person or not? I mean, you know, the average STS scholar or the average STS handbook does not. Uh, and do I think so? Yes, of course I think so. And would that bring more Latin American critics into the picture? Yes, of course it would. So, I mean, you know, it's, it's a question of what are the conversations that we ought to be having, but I think that there is a risk that I certainly don't have the answers to, that if you open wide the doors, to self-reflection, it's not clear what the self is that remains inside the reflection. Um, I mean, you know, our uh, psychological training says that the psychologist is necessary or the psychiatrist is necessary for the person to be able to arrive at this self-understanding. Supposing we were all patients and engaging in, uh, you know, a common encounter method instead of having the authority figure there somewhere, speaking to our conscience. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, it's, not, it's not easy to deal with that question, but for self-reflection, I think there needs to be some slightly stable understanding of self, and I'm not sure that our field has that understanding. I think there is time for just another one. Okay, the thanks. Last one. Thank you. Um, I want to ask you, um, here in Europe at least, um, dialogue between STS and innovation studies is going on. Um, I personally do believe that um, a political awareness, or let's say um, that this dialogue uh, should also be grounded into um, an understanding of power relations. And I just like to ask you whether you uh, had the opportunity up to now to uh, look at how uh, this uh, political turn can also address this dialogue between STS and innovation studies. Thanks. Well, that's a really big question, but the answer is, of course, it can. Um, one very basic entry point is that when governments today are talking about innovation, uh, mostly they already have a socio-technical imaginary of what innovation means. And um, in, uh, I mean, so which, which innovations do we choose to reward and privilege? Now, to some extent, of course, STS scholars who do bottom-up studies have always stressed that innovation can come from society. Uh, but I'm not sure that those findings and those orientations are in any way in conversation with the centers of power. Um, so, you know, we have a nanotechnology initiative. 
uh, I mean, unless you think of, and we have synthetic biology, I mean, you know, it's always the sort of frontier parts of the sciences that are leading the innovation discussion as far as national and state policies are concerned. I mean, you could think that education, which is a topic of interest in, for policy in all countries, is one of those areas where innovation talk is happening that is more about the from the bottom up in some sense. Uh, and SDS scholars can do a lot, and to some extent they already are doing some stuff, on the use of indicators in those areas, often very problematic uses of indicators, the measures of excellence, you know, what, what should the democratic citizen in a, a society today be learning about? Um, there have been battles already for decades about the extent to which any person leaving high school in any country should have STS as part of their training. It goes back to the question of self and self-reflection and what STS, will the right STS please stand up? I mean, that is obviously a, an issue. But nevertheless, I think that education is, I mean, if you widen the lens to say that education policy is a place already where a discussion between innovation and STS is happening. One can look at that and say, you know, what else needs to be added to that to get a fuller and richer discussion? Um, the question of, um, I mean, you know, I think that we need to argue that uh, Gandhi was as much an innovator as Bill Gates. Um, and maybe the idea of nonviolence is at least as important to the world as the idea of being Facebook friends. Uh, so um, let's reflect on what innovation means and what STS scholars, but this is my symmetry point, right? I mean, that is which innovations do we choose to look at and see why they take hold, how the idea originated, how does it become something that becomes robust. I mean, so it doesn't begin necessarily in the lab with the discovery of PCR or something like that. It can equally begin in an economic activity like the Grameen Bank or an idea of human progress like nonviolence. And that's precisely what I mean by doing that second, that third symmetry. So, Thank you again also for the questions and for the answers. I would like to, to, to thank you again, Sheila Dedanov. And before giving the last, uh, the floor for the last word to, to Paolo Magauda, I would like to, uh, to ask to all of us to thank the steering committee of STS Italia and the scientific committee uh, of the conference for uh, organizing the conference. And also I would like to thank all the people going around the tracks, uh, uh, helping for solving technical problems, the people uh, serving at the desk uh, of the conference or the book uh, desk uh, and so on. I would like to thank all <laughs> People, thank you very much for the organizing and making this conference so good and successful. Thank you, and Paolo. Yeah, just a few words uh, to uh, follow with th uh, thanks uh, to many, the many persons who um, make this event possible. Uh, because conferences are in some way like movies that they end, they, at, the, at, at the end, um, there is. Um, a list, a long list of people who, who participated. Politecnico di Milano was one important uh, point because uh, they hosted us and collaborated with STS Italia, the Department of Design. The doctoral program in design participated also in the event. We had also the collaboration of uh, Fondazione Bassetti uh, who um, uh, also organized a session inside the conference. FastWeb contributed in the conference with uh, important uh, support. Um, then there is a very long list. I want just to say 
um, a few, uh, few names, uh, Claudio Coletta, who spent six months in the process behind all the conference, Stefano Krabu, renamed the lion, <laughs> was another important person, Ilaria um, Mariani helped all, I think, all of us to, to, with technical problems and logistics. Uh, then Tiziana, Michela, Marco, um, Lucia, uh, Andrea, um, Laura, uh, a lot of people uh, um, put many, many, many um, time and uh, efforts in the conference. Um, one more person we have to thank very um, a lot for the conference, which is Paolo Volonté, uh, who spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, he put a lot of passion in the organization of the conference, he put his home, his car, part of his family. <laughs> I mean, so thank you a lot uh, to all these people. And uh, just two words more, we will, SDS Italia will organize the next conference in um, uh, 2016, uh, but before we will have an international summer school next year, if someone of you is interested, and I remember you that uh, there is uh, the Italian Journal of Science and Technology Studies, and we uh, hope that many of the people who um, presented in the conference will send an article uh, to the journal. Thank you. So I would like also to remember that uh, in 2016 is 10 years of the STS Italian uh, life. So we have to organize a special conference. 